Depending on how you look at it, this very well could be the chart that represents internet culture the most. It shows the birth, peak, and ultimately the replacement of a meme. These charts are from Google Trends. I got them by typing in C-Punk and Vaporwave. It started on June 1st, 2011 with a Twitter exchange between two multimedia producers. Here in this moment, C-Punk was immortalized on the internet via a hashtag. But the group of people who retweeted and liked that tweet were just getting started. First, do you mind introducing yourself? My moniker is Ultra Demons. I was considered to be one of the godparents of C-Punk. They began sharing art and music, chopping up and remixing 90s-inspired visuals and sounds, utilizing elements of cyberpunk to develop an oceanic aesthetic that they could get behind. I didn't really have much of a community, I guess, like that. And for mm-hmm. me, it kind of came from feeling like an outsider. Buzz around C-Punk spread quickly and small publications began tracking its every move. But it was still super underground and largely based on private Facebook groups. If you asked anybody on the street in 2012 what C-Punk was, they'd have no idea. Then, in March 2012, the New York Times attempted to capture C-Punk in an article. The headline? The Little Mermaid goes punk. Sea punk, a web joke with music, has its moment. Being a part of something that's a meme, it makes you question your own work. Like, so is this a joke? Like, is what I'm doing any good? Is this going to be taken seriously? It's debatable whether sea punk was a joke or a real attempt at developing an oceanic-themed subculture. But the article cites Katy Perry, Lady Gaga, and Azalea Banks as artists co-opting the style. But it doesn't stop there. Eight months later, at only a year old, C-Punk had an infamous week. Without any warning, it hit TV sets across the country. Ladies and gentlemen, Rihanna. Most writers tasked with covering Rihanna's green screen performance had no idea what to think, characterizing it as odd and trippy, and then quickly moving on to saying that she redeemed herself with the emotional ballad Stay. But the small band of web artists who spent the majority of 2011 and 2012 cultivating that look knew exactly what was happening, and it split them up on a very philosophical level. Many people claimed C-Punk died the moment Rihanna took the stage, but Others weren't as angry. I approached it with a positive. I think it's almost better to be a part of something that's inspiring people on that level in some way. In fact, this sort of thing has happened on SNL before. David Bowie. Back in 1979, David Bowie performed on SNL with Klaus Nomi, an opera singer who was a fixture of the East Village art scene of the mid-70s. Like Rihanna, Bowie was taking the opportunity to confront a large television audience was something from the underground. The difference here was that Nomi was on stage performing with Bowie. It's true that Rihanna, Azalea Banks, and Lady Gaga might be more associated with C-Punk than the artists that originated it. But in the age of the internet, underground styles, aesthetics, and movements are always transforming and adapting. They're two steps ahead. Today, C-Punk is still alive and kicking, but it's mutated for the most part into an even more popular musical subgenre called Vaporwave. It features elements of public access TV graphics and sounds, elevator music, and future funk. And Rihanna very well might be onto this subgenre too. You see, last year, Tame and Paolo, the musical project of Kevin Parker, released the album Currents. The album art, music videos, and sound all have elements of vaporwave. Rihanna's latest album, Anti, features a cover of a song from Currents called Same Old Mistakes. And it was produced by Kevin Parker himself. If you listen to that track in James Joint, a minute and 50 second interlude on Anti, you can't deny it. That elevator music and future funk sound signature to Vaporwave is there. 